We're here today with Professor Barry Eichengreen, who's a professor of economics at the University of California at Berkeley, and also one of our inaugural grantees for a very ambitious project to increase the number of students um, going through rigorous training in economic history, um, something he calls the Berkeley Economics History Lab. But first of all, Barry, could you tell us about this peculiar, you, you, this, you say there's this Berkeley school and there's this particular strategy you have uh, that's different from other economic history kind of training? I think at Berkeley, um, economic history is more integral to um, the training of PhD economists than almost anywhere else. So what is uh, distinctive and different about Berkeley economic historians is they speak not only to dedicated economic historians, but they speak to the economics profession uh, as a whole. Often, I think in our program, it's hard to quite know who is an economic historian and who is a macroeconomist or who is an economic historian and who is a, a labor economist because the audiences overlap. Uh, dissertation may have a historical chapter and other chapters that are either theoretical or use very modern data. Mm -hmm. So the lines between uh, economic history and the economics profession more broadly are fuzzier at Berkeley mm -hmm. and I think that's a good thing. And what is the origin of this Berkeley school? How did it come to be that uh, this was, this particular tradition came, came to be? Um, it's, a, it's a hard question to answer. Once upon a time, long, long ago, uh, uh, Berkeley Before was, your time? Yeah, Berkeley was very far from uh, uh, policy making uh, centers. It was time consuming and, and expensive to fly to uh, Washington DC and testify on Capitol Hill. What the Berkeley Economics Department did uh, so well was uh, economic theory. Gerard de Bru and uh, others built uh, uh, a very uh, famous and, and top-notch uh, theory program and economic history. Historians also traditionally not being involved in policy, although that has changed. And, and at one level, uh, in the good old days, theorists and economic historians at least in, in, in my department, would work very smoothly together. They saw one another as true scholars, and they appreciated what the other uh, group, in fact, did. And so that attracted you there. You were, you were at other institutions before there, and this, this, was a, this was a strong magnet for you in your own work. Yeah, it was. So um, w when I, I was thinking about uh, uh, what to do when I grew up, where to settle down at the end of my peripatetic uh, academic life, being somewhere with a critical mass of economic historians with uh, a thriving, active uh, seminar, and importantly, with a critical mass of graduate students doing economic history was important to me. Also to, to this day, I think we have more graduate students working in economic history and using economic history in, in, in their uh, PhD. Uh, research than, than virtually anywhere else. In your grant proposal, um, you uh, are asking, and, and we're helping you, uh, build out this program, ramp up this program, you use the phrase, um, and you see this as a response to the global financial crisis. Um, how's that? Many people would acknowledge that uh, hi historical research, institutional uh, research um, was neglected to an extent by the mainstream of the economics profession and in the wake of the crisis that should change. My view and the pitch that I made uh, successfully to INET was if you're serious about changing that, you have to uh, change the way people are trained and, and, and help to produce a, a new generation of scholars uh, who are more historically literate and who use uh, historical evidence and methods in, in more systematic ways, so mm -hmm. that's what we're trying to do. But what does that kind of background bring you that the, that the standard economics does not, um, you know, that the global financial crisis is an indictment of economics, um, that's a sort of standard around here at INET, okay, but isn't it an indictment of economic history also? Well, I think what economic history can add, number one, is uh, a better understanding of what aspects of current problems are new and novel and mm -hmm. which ones are not. So my argument would not be that we've seen it all before, 
rather than but that a, a, a deep knowledge of, of history enables you to uh, better identify what has been seen before and what mm -hmm. hasn't. Secondly, economic historians have a different attitude toward data. Uh, they are more into source criticism. Where did these data come from? What are their limitations? Sometimes uncritical use of, of, of data by uh, economists is something that, that we need to think about as uh, a profession and where a historical sensibility can help. And, and finally, institutions. So everybody talks about the importance of economists uh, analyzing institutions, and hardly anyone does anything about it. You know, you have to have uh, variation in the relevant institutions over time in order to be able to analyze them seriously. Where do you go to find that? Uh, answer history. Mm -hmm. Now your own work is largely in the international monetary area, is that right? Yeah, so I have worked over time on uh, uh, the gold standard, uh, the Bretton Woods system, the euro, um, three very different monetary uh, regimes o over the last century and a half. Mm -hmm. And you have a recent book, I believe. Thank you very much for mentioning that. Yeah. It's called uh, Exorbitant Privilege, The Rise and Fall of the Dollar and the Future of the International Monetary System. And it's about how the dollar became not only America, America's currency, but the world's. And uh, what the implications would be were that no longer true in, in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned this business about historical sensibility, so you're using, these are examples of historical sensibility, and how do they, and, and how do they connect up with current policy debates? That was the whole point, right? Right. So um, one question I ask in the book is, um, how did the dollar uh, become the world's currency? What did we in the United States, now connecting up with um, some of your work, Perry, how did we in the United States create a central bank to be a market maker of last resort? provide liquidity to markets in, in dollar-denominated securities and make, make it attractive for people in other countries to do their business uh, in our currency. Um, you can use that history to uh, ask and, and I think understand better what challenges uh, China will have to surmount in order to make its currency a true international currency. The history shows that we in the United States moved from a point where the dollar was not used internationally at all in before World War One. Before World War One, in 1914, to where the dollar was already the leading global currency in 1924. We did it in 10 years. The history suggests to me, if the Chinese uh, pursue the same goal single-mindedly, they can do the same. Hmm. One of the things that we learned in this global financial crisis is about the international role of the dollar, which has sort of been hidden from the discussion of the dollar inside, you know, inside the U.S. Um, and everyone is shocked, 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 okay, that the Fed was lending to European banks, um, whereas if they had read your book or had some knowledge of history, they would not have been shocked at all. Um, and so it, it shows that, 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 that the level of knowledge about the institutions, the basic facts that have been true, as you say, since 1924 even, okay, is, uh, are scarce on the ground and, and could be a, a useful input into policy debates. So how can I disagree? I, I would only add yeah. that um, I do think we were fortunate to have it at the helm of, of the Federal Reserve. Um, a scholar, Ben Bernanke, who did know that history and did, uh, did understand, along with his colleagues, that the dollar played a, a global role and that when Lehman Brothers failed, the Fed had to inject liquidity not only into U.S. financial markets, but had to provide $120 billion uh, of loans to four uh, foreign central banks. I think that was important for stabilizing the global economy. It, it caused the Fed to, to um, come under, under a lot of criticism from people who didn't know the history, as you say, or understand fully what the stakes were. Mm -hmm. Well, we wish you very good luck in your project to uh, widen this, the, the range of people who do, uh, to, do understand that and teach it and, and bring this into our culture and, bring, and widen the conversation. And meanwhile, thank you for a very stimulating conversation and welcome to the stable of iNet Economists. Thank you. Thank you.